Okay, everyone. Uh-oh, I saw a few people sort of jump. If you already fell asleep, wake up. <laughs> Hello, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome to the first session of Death by Design. We are so happy to see all of you here. We've been working towards this for a while, so it feels very exciting. Welcome. I'm Caroline, and I'm one of the independent living navigators here. I'm going to kick things off for us with a little bit of housekeeping, an overview of the program, and I'm also going to introduce our other speakers and the rest of the Death by Design Committee. I want to give a shout out to our overflow audience in the chapel as well. They are watching this live, um, so they're with us here in spirit. Welcome, everyone. Um, ha ha. Let's see, how do we go to the next slide? That should be the easy part. Here we go. I wanted to add a little suspense. I'm going to start by getting us in the mind frame of what we're here to talk about by reading this piece titled Afterglow. You do have a printout of all of the slides that was on your chair, so feel free if that's easier to look at. I'd like the memory of me to be a happy one. I'd like to leave an afterglow of smiles when life is done. I'd like to leave an echo whispering softly down the ways of happy times and laughing times and bright and sunny days. I'd like the tears of those who grieve to dry before the sun of happy memories that I leave when life is done. So before we go any further, let's recap the history of this program series. This was last presented in 2017 and it was titled Your Life, Your Legacy how to depart in peace and not leave a mess. Although we've retitled the program to Death by Design, those are still our two main goals, how to depart in peace and not leave a mess for those who you leave behind. So those are still the two things that we're focusing on in this program. We planned to rerun the legacy series in 2020, but there was a small hiccup called a global pandemic and that put a wrench in our plans. So as I said, this has been a long time coming. We're really happy to um, revive the 2017 series now, finally again in 2022. I wanna give a huge thank you to resident Judith Moore. She has really spearheaded this effort. Although we are the ones up here speaking, none of this could have happened without Judith. Um, in partnership with Judith has been the navigation department. So that's my... who rounds out the Death by Design Committee. Um, we've had a lot of help from Mary Ellen Stone, Bo Strobin. A lot of people have chipped in to help make this um, effort a reality. So thank you to everyone. And most of all, to those of you who signed up to come. None of this would have happened without all of you. So pat on the back. What is the objective of this program? We are aiming to present information and experiences about the process of, spoiler alert, dying, <laughs> so that our residents can have tools and knowledge to create an end of life journey that is open, honest, and as stress-free as possible. Note the word here, create. 
We want you to be an active participant in planning your end of life, right? That is a time that is by you and for you and that we are excited to encourage you to take ownership of. I have a friend, a resident here, who came to my office and said, just want to let you know, I'm not going to be coming to your death by design series. I said, okay, why not? And he said, I'm going to try to focus right now on just living. And although I understand what he was saying, what I responded to him and what I would say to all of you is that talking about dying is part of living. It can also help us die better and live better. So we are so excited to help you do this planning ahead of time. So then when end of life does occur, you can be fully present in that chapter, which can actually be really special and beautiful. I hope by the end of this five weeks, you will agree that end of life can be a really meaningful time. And if we prepare and get a lot of this stuff done before that time arises, the beauty will be even more apparent in that end of life chapter. That being said, it can be a difficult topic to discuss. Everyone has a different relationship with death. And I wanna commend you on being brave enough to be here today. So why are these conversations important? I want to show you a short video from the Conversation Project. You'll hear more about the Conversation Project and what they do throughout today's talk and further sessions. But Ellen Goodman is the co-founder and director of that program, and I really like what she says. The Conversation Project emphasizes having a conversation about death centered on values what matters to you, not what's the matter with you. So we're gonna play this short video. Hopefully we won't have any- About her wishes for- End of life care. From time to time, she would say something like, if I'm ever like that, pull the plug. <laughs> but of course, when she became ill, there was no plug to pull. And also my mother had dementia at the end. So we were not able to have any conversation about what her wishes were. So I was her healthcare decision maker. And in the last months, years, really, I had a cascading number of decisions to make for which I assure you, I was totally unprepared and in fact, blindsided. What I learned from the experience of talking about my mother's end of life is that guess what? This experience is far too common. Far too many of the people we love are not dying in the way that they would choose. Far too many of their survivors are left guilty, depressed, uncertain about whether they have done the right thing. 70% of people say they want to die at home and 70% of people are dying in hospitals and institutions. That's a just a huge disconnect between what people wish and what happens. We can change that. That's why the Conversation Project emphasizes having a talk about values, about what matters to you, not what's the matter with you, but what matters to you, and what's important for you to think about at the end of your life. Are you a person who wants all the information or do you want just enough? Are you someone who is going to make all decisions for yourself or do you want your family to be involved? What's important to you at the end of life, then you've given them a real staff, a guide. We started the conversation project with just a small group of people around a table when we sat down, we brought in experts in the field, and it was the experts in the field who told us that if we're gonna change the way people die in America, we have to go outside the medical system and change the cultural norm from not talking about what we wanted at the end of life to talking about it. One of the things that the conversation does is, is tell your parents that you're gonna be there for them, that you're not gonna leave them 
isolated in the hands of strictly medical people. The medical community is just beginning to be conversation ready. A generation ago, we transformed how people were born. It was not the medical profession that said, come into the hospital with your video camera, let's have a baby in a bathtub, and don't all the husbands want to come into the birthing room? It was not, I assure you. Birth is a human experience, not just a medical experience. And part of what we're doing in talking with people is, is recapturing and saying, dying is part of the human experience. It's part of a natural progression in life. We have the capacity to transform how people die in this country. I think everybody does have a, an idea of what a good death would be. When you ask people, the word that comes up the most is peaceful. The Conversation Project is very much about connecting. It's about sharing, and it's about being open and loving to each other through a very difficult journey. So I really like what she said. Dying is part of the human experience. And she also said that most people use one word when describing their wishes for end of life peaceful. And we hope that this program can be a small part of helping create that for all of you. Next slide. Maybe if I say it, it will happen. Next slide. Perfect. Okay. So a little bit of housekeeping. I want to go over what to expect over the next five weeks. Hopefully all of these chairs will be filled in five weeks, as many as they are in week one. <laughs> we know it's a commitment to sign up for a five week series, but we promise to make it worth your while. And again, we really appreciate you showing up today. So today's session, how can I control how I'm treated if I get ill? Um, Lori and Kim are going to talk about this and of course, please feel free to take notes on the handouts of today's slide. I do wanna highlight the supplemental sessions that are going to happen each Wednesday. Like I said, I know it's a big commitment to sign up for five Friday sessions, but we really do urge you to also attend the Wednesday sessions. That's going to be a chance to really dig deeper and see some incredible content that touches on this topic. For example, this coming Wednesday, we'll be watching a documentary called Consider the Conversation. If I can't convince you to come, let me tell you, it does have a five-star rating on Amazon. So please attend next Wednesday. The following Friday for session two, we're going to have what happens to me if I am ill before I die. In the video we just watched, it talks about dying being a human experience in addition to a medical experience. We're excited to have Dr. Heidi White come and talk about that medical side of things. That will be our next session. She'll be talking about things including hospice care, palliative care, end of life, morphine, things that um, people usually have a lot of questions about. So we hope you'll attend that. In addition to that week's supplemental session, the following Wednesday, we'll have a TED Talk and another documentary called Being Mortal. Those also give some of the medical perspective while humanizing death at the same time. Session three, what do loved ones do after my death? This goes along with the original legacy program title, how to depart in peace and not leave a mess. A lot of people comment that their main concern is lessening the amount of stress for family members after they pass away. So this will be presented by navigation and also the chaplaincy department, talking about things such as planning um, a memorial or a service. What do you want to happen after you die? 
not talking about the afterlife, but <laughs> what happens um, to those who are still here in that planning process after you pass. We'll have a really special supplementary session on Wednesday, October 5th. Please mark your calendars, particularly for this date, and invite all of your friends and neighbors. This is going to be an expo that is open not just to those who have signed up for Death by Design, but to the entire Crowsdale community. We have about a dozen um, representatives from different experts in the field of end of life, from funeral homes and crematoriums to death doulas, grief counselors, social workers, and everything in between. So come drop in between 2 and 3.30 for that supplementary session, which is the expo. And more information will come soon about that. The next Friday session is titled, What Can I Do If I'm Ready to Die? And this is going to be presented by two VSED experts, V-S-E-D, Voluntary Stopping Eating and Drinking. The Schaefers um, are really well respected in this field and give a phenomenal presentation. There will also be lots of time then for questions. So we do urge you to come to all of the sessions and that will be particularly interesting. The supplementary session following will be um, that Wednesday we'll have what's called a death cafe. That's gonna be hosted by a certified death doula. And a death cafe is a smaller group um, where we can talk about a sometimes taboo subject in a cozy and comfortable cafe environment. Um, there will be an extra sign up for that because we're capping it at 40 people. I'll talk more about that in a moment. Our last session on October 14th, most importantly, what happens to my stuff after death? <laughs> we are going to have an estate planning attorney come and speak to us on this topic. We're also going to have some speakers from Crowsdale talk about um, the policies and procedures here at the village for what happens after death. Last but not least, the final supplementary session, again, an extra sign up will be required, but that is the session where you'll write legacy letters. Jane Hoover, one of our residents and a very accomplished writer will be leading that session. So we're really excited. Again, I do urge you to take advantage of all of these main sessions and also the supplementary Wednesdays. I think you won't regret it. So a few other pieces of information, like I mentioned, the supplemental sessions on the 12th and the 19th of October, that's the Death Cafe and the Legacy Letters, those events do have a maximum capacity. So on October 5th, the week before the Death Cafe, we'll be putting out sign-up sheets for those supplementary sessions at the Life Enrichment Board. So make note of October 5th when those sign-up sheets will go out. I also um, want to mention the incredible selection of resources in our very own Crowsdale Library. Again, thank you so much to Judith, the Drusidos, and all of the team at our CV Library. We have a list of DVDs and books specifically on this topic of dying well. They've been pulled and are on display with the um, session signage in the library, in the AV room for the DVDs and at the main table for the books. So if you're looking for homework, that's the place to go. Please take advantage of these topical resources. I also wanna plug something that's not specifically part of Death by Design, but again, could be a helpful additional source of information. Um, this Sunday at 6 p.m., the movie is um, on this topic. It's called Big Fish. Has anyone seen it? Okay, a couple. It's a good movie. I do recommend it. It's based on the novel by Daniel Wallace, who was here in July and spoke to us. It tells the story of a young man who is trying to learn more about his father as his father is reaching end of life. 
So although not a documentary, it is very thought provoking and um, we recommend checking that out. Last but not least, before I hand it on to our next presenter, I do want to mention that on the homepage of Vibrant, our resident portal, you'll see our Death by Design logo, the tree. You can click on that or click below where it says click here. <laughs> and that will take you to a web page that we've created that has links and PDFs to all these resources that we're mentioning. So if you go to Vibrant, the homepage like you see here, you'll click to see the website. The homepage has the schedule of events that I just went over. And then in the top right, there's a tab that says resources. Click on that and you'll see a list of all the resources that we mentioned, and you can click to um, visit those sites. So that was just the introduction. What do you think? <laughs> We're now going to talk about today's topic. How can I control how I'm treated if I get ill? So please welcome my friend and colleague, Lori Leathers. She's a little bit um, shorter than me, so we're going to, here you go, Lauren. Step right here. This is so the folks in the chapel can see our faces. Mm -hmm. okay. Caroline? Yes. Question. How are you gonna handle the overflow for those two extra booking sessions? Um, if there's a lot of interest, we could definitely consider how will we handle the overflow for those supplementary sessions that require sign up. If there's a lot of interest, so more than 40 for the Death Cafe and more than 20 for the Legacy Letters, we would definitely be open to scheduling um, a repeat for the overflow who couldn't make it. Yes. Uh, can you confirm the time for all these sessions? Yes. Every single thing on the calendar is 2 o'clock to 3.30. Yes, good question. Thank you. It's working. Okay. All right. Hello, I'm Lori Leathers, and I'm a social worker in health service navigation and independent living. And I'm going to be talking to you about starting a conversation about end-of-life decisions with your family and loved ones. I want you to ask yourself a question. How can I control how I am treated if I get ill? I'm gonna give you three steps to help you successfully answer that question. Number one, Think about how you want to be treated and what is important to you. Number two, talk with the important people in your life about your wishes. And number three, record these decisions in writing. So now that we've identified these three steps that will allow you to control how you're treated, if you get ill, we're going to talk a little bit, a little bit more in depth about these details. As you think about how you want to be treated, ask yourself these questions. Oh, thank you. Okay. Ask yourself these questions. If my health situation worsens, what do I want to happen? If my health situation worsens, what don't I want to happen? What does a good day look like for me? And what or who supports me during difficult times? And then try to finish this sentence. What matters to me through the end of my life is. So you've asked yourself these questions. Now it's time to have the conversation with your family and loved ones.
Okay. Having this discussion can be difficult because we are all at different starting points and have different attitudes when it comes to talking about death and dying. These variations and attitudes can be attributed to numerous factors and life experiences. When it comes to discussing our mortality, people's comfort levels range from infancy to full maturity and every stage in between. And because it can be difficult, I'm here to give you some suggestions to help facilitate the process on how to get the conversation started. So how do you start talking about this? You could suggest having coffee with family and start by talking about your own desires and preferences for end of life. And then ask your loved ones, I was wondering if you ever had ever thought about these things. You can use the news or maybe a movie you saw as a conversation starter. I read an article, saw the news or watched a movie about end of life planning. And it really got me thinking about these things for myself. A medical appointment can be effective. Sometimes a medical professional's approach may work better for some people than if a family member raises the issue. You can connect with one family member, even if, the, if, even if there's a, we don't talk about that rule in your family. There may be one family member who is more open to the discussion than others in your family. You can start with baby steps by talking to that person first. If you feel it's time for a family discussion, the holidays may be the right time. You, that's a time when family tends to come together all in one place, but you don't necessarily wanna have it on the day that you have this celebration dinner. You, yeah, you may wanna suggest, let's meet tomorrow morning for breakfast or Let's meet tomorrow evening and have leftovers, and that might be a good time to start the conversation. Uh, you can also use the Conversation Project Online Starter Kit, which we had that video about. Um, they have, those are good props to start a conversation. Or you can use the Five Wishes document. That's also a good conversational starter. The important thing is to keep the conversation going. Okay. So we're we're going to show you show to you a, a family having the end of life conversation in this video. If I can get it going. You're doing it. And finally tonight, ABC News wants to join you in something right at the heart of the American family. How we can all help the people who care about us make decisions near the end of our lives. And nine out of 10 of you have told us that we should all be talking about it at all ages, what we want. And yet only a fraction of us have done it. And we know it makes a huge difference in the health of the caregiver as well as those cared for. So ABC News has taken cameras inside a vital loving family, part of a new community, deciding to have the conversation. This is 85-year-old Norb and his daughter, Maureen. My dad is 85 today. He's still very, very active. He's a wonderful friend. Throughout life, daughter and father have always talked about everything, except one thing, how to control the end of your life in the same way you control the prime of your life. So dad and daughter gather the family together, three generations, for an act of love. And so now we're just asking that you share some of your thoughts about 
what you would like at the end of your life um, so that we can honor your wishes. They are part of something new underway for families in America that says having the conversation is a gift parents and children give each other. And there's proof of the difference it makes. Studies show depression rates plummet after a loss if the families have had the conversation. Renowned physician Dr. Atul Gawande says doctors and nurses see it firsthand. When you're there in that moment and you're talking to the family and you're saying, how much will it bother your father if he ends up this way? And they say, more often than not, I don't know. We never talked about it. That, that it is incredibly traumatic for the family, for the doctors involved. There's often conflict. Um, it can tear families apart. So Dr. Guande has become part of a team led by Pulitzer Prize winning writer Ellen Goodman. It is called The Conversation Project. It is a kind of guide for families looking for a way to begin. If we give them a way to talk about it and give people something to hang on to when they're afraid to start this conversation, they can do it and pass it on. Families like the Jennings. They looked over the conversation guide before they sat down together. First, there's laughter. Oh, my golf swing's still good. <laughs> <laughs> and then dad directly eases his daughter's guilt and worry about having put their mother in hospice. I felt like that meant we were giving up on mom. She was in a lot of pain, and I think, uh, I think it was handled real well. And next, Our Maureen kids, asks her dad for clarity on what he considers a good end to a great okay, life. So if you were in a condition where you couldn't make decisions for yourself, how, how extreme would you want us to take measures to save your life versus letting you go? Well, I, I, I think I'm ready to go anytime. You know, I, I wouldn't prolong anything. I mean, uh, I, I've lived a great life. Pretty lucky. Pretty lucky. And because of you guys, you know. And Unexpectedly, a grandson is inspired to speak up about his own wishes for his own life. That if there was no meaningful communication, that that I would want I would want you to to, to stop trying to intervene. We aren't ready for you to go that soon. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're not ready for you to go that no. soon either. So <laughs> one by one, the others weigh in. All ages. Do that. Happy birthday, dear grandpa. And with that, another family has joined a kind of estate planning for the heart. Go. The conversation beginning in America. So please tell us your stories in the days ahead about ways to begin the conversation with family members of all ages. Or if you don't want to have it, tell us about that too. My colleague and my friend, anchor Bill Ritter from WABC and I will be reading your emails and looking at the great photos you're already sending us of your families. So go to abcnews.com, find the conversation and the guide, and we'll be seeing you right there. I like that video. I'm gonna read you another example of a family having a conversation. End of life decisions aren't made alone. For some of you, your wishes may matter less to you than wishes of the people you love. Or rather your highest wish may be that your loved one's wishes are met. Here's a story that illustrates that point. Rebecca Sudor, a geriatrician and palliative medicine physician in the U.S. whose career is devoted to studying and developing tools for advanced care planning, decided it was time to have a frank conversation with her grandma and grandpa as her grandfather became increasingly frail. As described in an article published in the Journal of the American Medical Association, her grandfather told her he had a good run, that he loved his wife of 65 years and was not afraid of dying. He told her he was tired and didn't want any mechanical intervention. No breathing tubes, no shocks, no pushing on my chest, just let me go. Rebecca says he was willing to try treatments that would make him feel better, comfort care. 
such as wound care and pain management, as well as the treatments he was already getting. But he said, if they're giving me it to me, if they're giving it to me just to give it to me, then forget about it. At that point, Rebecca turned to her grandmother, who would be the ultimate decision maker should her grandfather become, un become unable to make his own decisions. Well, darling, she said, of course I would tell the doctors to do everything possible to keep my husband alive. Rebecca was stunned. She just had a lovely candid and specific discussion with her grandfather about his wishes. Hadn't her grandmother heard what he'd said? So then asked, so she then asked her grandmother to tell her what she had heard her grandfather say. And her grandmother repeated his wishes, but said she loved her husband too much to let him go. If he is with me just one more day, it would be worth it to me, she said, she told her granddaughter. It would be worth it to me, even if he were hooked up to machines and not able to talk to me. Rebecca turned back to her grandfather and asked, did you just hear what grandma said? He said he did. She asked how he felt about her going against his wishes and requesting a feeding tube, ventilator, shocks, and other treatments he had said he did not want. Is that okay with you, she asked in disbelief. Her grandfather said it was. I am ready to go, but if it helps your grandmother to feel that she did everything possible for me, even if it's because she doesn't want me to go, that is okay. She is the one who has to go on living with her decision. If this is what she wants, then this is what I want because I love her. Rebecca realized that in that moment that her grandfather's wishes were being honored above all else. He wanted a death that his wife could live with. Relieving his wife's emotional burden was more important to him than all else. And he was willing to grant his wife leeway or flexibility in making medical decisions for him. For all of the focus on patient autonomy, nobody makes decisions in a vacuum. What we want is often shaped, is often shaped by the people we love and the context of our lives. Giving the people we love agency and choice in our care is something that may feel both right and useful. Thank you. And now Kim is gonna come and elaborate on recording your wishes. Thank you, Lori. Have a problem advancing off from the video slides. And finally Oops. tonight, ABC no, no. News wants to join. Right. We already saw you, Diane. Do you know how to do it? Oh, there you go. All right. So yes, you have to think about your decision, uh, talk to the loved ones, and then we um, record what our wishes are. Um, so I'm gonna talk about the documents that are out there, what they mean, things like that. When you moved into Crowsdale Village, we did ask you for documents. We asked you for a durable power of attorney, a healthcare power of attorney, and a living will. And sometimes we get those documents, and sometimes we don't. Sometimes people say, oh yeah, that's on my list of things to do, and I've got an appointment with a, an attorney to get those documents done. Um, but um, what, what we really do like is to have them, when you move in, those you know, bare documents right there. Um, another thing that's very important, I think, just for the, the function of the community is talking about the emergency contact and how we communicate you know, within the community. So 
When you moved here, we do have, and we've probably given you what's called a file of life. Um, and as you can see, it's uh, what you probably are familiar with is the smaller red, um, it's a magnetic little sleeve and it has a fairly small piece of paper in it. We ask that you pencil in some important information in that and that is things like your emergency contact people, your diagnoses, your medications and things like that. Given that it is a very small sleeve, um, we do have another process in play right now, which is the, the larger one um, on the right hand of your screen. Um, and that is actually a full eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. It is also magnetic. Um, and we do ask that you put both of these, either one of these um, on your refrigerator. Now, quick poll, how many people in here have a refrigerator that is not magnetic on the front? There's a few of you. Who thought that was a good idea, right? Oh, um, yes. So our idea was stick this on the front of your refrigerator. Um, and now there are some refrigerators that actually aren't magnetic. But what I would say is if you need um, assistance to uh, adhere it to a, the refrigerator, particularly with tape, unfortunately, um, we would be glad to assist you with that. Security would be glad to assist you with that. Um, you can also stick it on the side because apparently the side of the refrigerators are magnetic. Uh, but just know that that is not as much in clear view. And these documents are meant to be um, seen in an emergency, particularly an emergency in your apartment. Security is trained to look at the refrigerator and look for these documents. So um, with particular, the larger eight and a half by 11, one of the nice things about that is, is if you go to your doctor and he discharges you and you get a nice printout of your medications, you can go ahead and stick that right in that file of life. Every time you come back from the doctor and you have a new medication or a new medication list, um, you don't have to you know, spend the time writing it out. You could actually stick that right in that eight and a half by 11, as well as uh, copies of other documents like your uh, healthcare power of attorney or your living will or your do not resuscitate order. So it's, um, it's handy for a lot more, it holds a lot more than the smaller one. So one of the documents we do ask that you give us when you move in is a durable or general power of attorney. This gives power to somebody else to make decisions on your behalf. Um, much of Many of those decisions involve things like financial issues, tax issues, real estate issues. Um, those documents need to highly recommend anyways that you have them drawn up by an attorney so that they understand you know, what your situation is. They can tailor that document to you. Um, and um, they can be drawn up a couple different ways. One is that they can take effect as soon as you sign it, or they can have a clause in there that says when you no longer can make these decisions, then your chosen power of attorney can go ahead and do that. I've seen the documents both ways. If you have a trusting son, daughter, friend, whoever that you name as your power of attorney, um, and they and you trust that they're not going to um, overstep their bounds before it's time, having that be effective when you sign that document, it eliminates one less hurdle of trying to uh, prove that somebody does not have capacity. So there are many times where I go to Dr. White and I say, oh, we need a letter for the, the bank to say that somebody doesn't have capacity anymore so that it, it enacts this power of attorney. 
Um, but if, if some of the powers of attorney are enacted right when they're signed, and uh, then you, you don't have to go through that step. And one more thing that the, uh, this power of attorney should be registered with at the county clerk's office. So. And then we have medical or healthcare power of attorney. So that's a legal document and it names a healthcare proxy, which is somebody to make medical decisions for you at times when you may not be able to. So your proxy, also known as a surrogate or, or agent, should be familiar with your values and your wishes so that they can make decisions about your treatment. Lori did a nice job of talking about that discussion. And this is somebody that you're gonna feel comfortable with. You're gonna feel comfortable that they know you as a person, also that they're gonna be comfortable in that role. That many times it's somebody who maybe has a little bit of knowledge about the healthcare you know, industry, knows the questions to ask. Um, sometimes it's somebody that may not be really close to you so that they can have that objective distance. Um, but this is a uh, medical or healthcare power of attorney. We have these forms in our navigator office. If you need one, it is a state form and um, we could give that to you. I wanna talk a little bit about my chart. As we talk about our healthcare power of attorney, one of the things I think, I've been in this business for 20 years plus, one of the things that I think has been really helpful for the powers of attorney is being able to have access to the electronic charts. Um, so we encourage that you guys, you know, if you can get access and then um, we can also uh, advise that your power of attorney has access to your medical chart so that they can follow along and they can understand all the things that are happening with your medical care and better advocate for you. If you need assistance with the Duke uh, My Chart, you can certainly ask uh, one of the navigators and uh, we can help you with that. These days, a lot of people are pretty savvy. Probably your sons and daughters are all about their own charts, probably not you know, a big deal to get into your charts. So. Um, we talked about this, Living Well. Uh, it is just a written document that helps you tell doctors how you want to be treated if you are dying or permanently unconscious and cannot make decisions about emergency treatment. So in a living will, um, you can say which procedures you would like. And they talk about feeding tubes, they talk about being on a ventilator, and they talk about having CPR and whether you would want those things or you wouldn't want those things and under what circumstance. There is a document called Five Wishes. Um, this document's been around for a while and it actually contains both a living will and a healthcare power of attorney. And it even goes a little bit further to ask some questions to help guide caregivers on what comfort measures you would like or how you would wanna be treated if you are ill or if you were dying. Um, Five Wishes is now recognized in 46 states. The last time I did this presentation, it was 42 states. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's recognized in North Carolina. So in one swoop, you could get both of those documents with your um, Five Wishes. If you go to this website, they may charge you for the document, but we have actually purchased documents here through Crowsdale. So if you need um, a document, you could get one from us, but know that we have to pay for it too, so. All right. And then a little bit about um, a HIPAA authorization form. Um, this is an authorization telling medical personnel who they can legally share information with. So there is a form that you can get your attorney to draw up. And, um, 
it would be recognized at any medical establishment that you went to. Um, and also know that every medical establishment that you do go to also has their own HIPAA authorization form. So you're signing that as well. Um, and Crowsdale also has one. They have asked you to sign it upon uh, your entering uh, Crowsdale. And they actually published their privacy practices out by door one on the wall, if you had some time and wanted to read it. And it's also published down by the pavilion door. I'm going to talk a little bit about two directives that um, you can only get from your doctor. So the DNR um, or in the most form, let's talk about the DNR. DNR stands for do not resuscitate. Um, do not resuscitate order is a very specific order giving the directive that you do not want to be given CPR or have your heart shocked by a defibrillator if your heart were to stop beating. So in order to get this DNR, and it's a yellow form over there, you have to have a conversation with your doctor and the doctor's signature needs to be on that yellow form. These forms do not expire. And uh, it's very important to know that only the original form will be honored. You cannot make copies of this. If you want more than one form, maybe you want one for the refrigerator and then you wanna carry one with you, ask your doctor to fill out two or three. But it is very important to know that this do not resuscitate order will only be honored if it is visible when you are having a heart emergency. And I stood out there and watched a bunch of people come in and I saw a few folks, and I know a few folks, that actually carry their do not resuscitate order with them. Uh, you can grab a, you can get a, um, a, a sleeve from the resident services desk that you can stick your, um, your, your nameplate in. Your, your badge, I call it badge. But with, along with that, you can fold up this do not resuscitate order and stick it behind your, um, your name badge and you can carry it around with you. And I know a lot of folks do. Now, and that is advantageous if something were to happen to you right now in the auditorium. Um, and if there were to, to happen to be an emergency, please don't let there be an emergency. But if there was, and we had to call medical staff here, if that is visible and on you, and we see that, and particularly the medical professionals who respond to you see that do not resuscitate order, then they will not perform CPR. But if they do not see that, when your medical emergency happens, they are obligated to do everything possible to save your life. So this is called a portable form, a, a portable uh, do not resuscitate. It's supposed to kind of be taken with you. Very often these forms, these yellow forms in particular are for the, the ambulance drivers and the medical personnel who show up at an emergency. And so you wanna think in your head, if this is really, really important to you, you need to have that form with you when uh, at, at all times. It can't be in your purse because they're not going to be shuffling through your purse or your walker or something like that. It has to be very obvious uh, so that when they uh, you know, are on the scene, they see this yellow form. And then in, along with that, we have what's called the most form or the medical orders for scope of treatment. This covers a little bit more. And what we see is that doctors, the nurse practitioners will start to um, bring this form into the care plan as somebody's medical situation becomes more complicated and things get maybe towards the end. This is where you may make a decision to say, you know what, I don't wanna be sent to the hospital anymore. 
or if I get a, an infection or pneumonia, I don't want those antibiotics anymore. So this is a form that specifically uh, goes through those types of questions. And again, it tends to travel with you. Um, if you're in the pavilion, it'll be there. If you get sent out from the pavilion, that form will go with you. Um, so this, this is more uh, towards, the, towards the end. We're talking about CPR, we're talking about medical interventions, including going to the hospital, antibiotics, tube feedings, hydration, things like that with our, med with our most form. So when should you update these? Well, first off, we need them in our system when you move in, and that's why we ask for just the, the, the basic ones. But one of the interesting things is every year, the navigation department and I try to um, remind you on April 16th. It actually is what we call National Healthcare Decision Day. And it's tagged right after April 15th. <laughs> because there are two things in life that you can count on, taxes and death. So yes, you get done with your taxes on the 15th and then you think about, okay, do I have all my paperwork in order? You wanna ask yourself, have, has there been any changes in your healthcare, um, in your health over the past year that are maybe gonna change the way you, you need to do these forms? And are there any changes to your healthcare agent that would maybe not make them appropriate? Um, and particularly when we get um, you know, up in age, I think that the, um, the first go-to is that you have a spouse that is, you know, knows you well for the last 50, 60, 70 years. And you, you obviously would um, you know, pick somebody like that, but as both, spouses, maybe um, their health is changing and things are changing. That may not be the most obvious reason. And that's a really good reason to kind of rethink the forms and maybe redo those forms and maybe think about, you know, I think my daughter or my son or my family friend or something like that is, is more able to do, to do that job. And then once you've updated those forms, give a copy to your navigator Give a copy to your healthcare providers, even uh, Duke Hospital, and any important people in your life. Your healthcare power of attorney definitely needs these, the, the healthcare power of attorney. Your power of attorney needs a copy of your power of attorney, but also, you know, give them some of those other forms as well. We have an electronic medical record here at Crowsdale. We put those in there. Um, the medical team can uh, pull them up if, if need be uh, to look at them and see what they say. So uh, we wanna make sure we have the most current documents. So I just wanna wrap up real quick and then I can get to some questions. Um, I just wanna say, you know, that what we talked about today is thinking, thinking about what's important to you, thinking about um, the people in your life that maybe you have to have a conversation with, how you're going to have that conversation, when you're going to have that conversation, and then making sure that you have these documents in line for, um, for, for everybody and everybody has them. Um, that's a lot of stuff that we just talked about. <laughs> So one of the things that Death by Design does have is a checklist. Um, I have actually a picture of it right here. This is going to this is a, like a 20 page document right now because there's going to be uh, other things throughout these five series that we are going to cover. Um, we do not have the, the checklist ready to to hand out to you quite yet, but it will be a nice thing for you to follow along with and, um, and be able to just kind of check off. I did this, I did this, this is all set, this is all set. Um, this will be coming and it might actually be on the website. I think it is, it's on the website. Um, it's on the website. You could probably pull it off right now and um, we will be giving these copies out, but just not today. 
I'm going to wrap up with a poem because Caroline started with, it's not a poem. It's actually just a saying. <laughs> she had the poem, I have the saying. Okay, this is actually said by somebody who wrote a book, the book called The Art of Dying Well, uh, Kate Butler. And she said, people who are willing to contemplate their aging vulnerability and mortality often live better lives in older age and illness and experience better deaths than those who don't. They get clear-eyed about the trajectory of their illnesses so they can plan. They regard their doctors as consultants, not bosses. They make peace with the coming of death and seize the time to forgive, to apologize, and to thank those they love. That concludes this session. Um, I think that we have some microphones for questions and uh, just you know some reminders up there about Wednesday's supplementary session. And then next Friday, we will be here with Dr. White. And one more reminder before we get to questions is that on your seats, you have an evaluation form. So we're interested in knowing uh, your thoughts and your feedback feel free to go and fill that evaluation form out. There is going to be a, there is a nice box outside the life and on the life enrichment counter, which is where you can put the, uh, the um, evaluation tools. So that's what I have. And we have some questions. And as we, um, as the questions are asked, I'm going to repeat them so that our lovely folks in the chapel can hear them as well. Thank you. Well, we're signing all of these forms for here and our physicians in the hospital. Do we need to have our signatures witnessed or notarized or do we take us at our word? Yeah. So the question was when we're signing these forms, um, do they need to be witnessed and notarized? And yes, um, there are forms that need to be witnessed and notarized, uh, particularly the living will, the um, healthcare power of attorney. They, they both need to be um, notarized and I think witnessed as well. Um, and the durable power of attorney, when I ask is that you get that done in a, an attorney's office. So they'll take care of all of that. If you need a notary here, it can be a little bit tricky because LCS rules say that some of our folks, even if they're notaries, cannot notarize certain forms. Um, but if you talk with Caroline or Lori or your navigator, we can try to help hook you up with, with somebody. I've been told that uh, ambulance, if you call ambulance, they will not. Um, respect your DNR, but if you call them, they can't use the DNR. Is, that is not true? No. So the question is, um, if an ambulance comes, um, the, the understanding was that they uh, would not respect a DNR. And that yellow form, and it has to be that yellow form, um, they absolutely will uh, respect. Um, so yes, that's, that is actually just for them. That yellow form is for those EMTs that show up in an emergency. Kim, I was told, I'm sure three years ago, that those forms should be filled in and returned. I'd like to know if I did, where are they? <laughs> I'd like to see them and see if I still agree to that. So I'm sure if you handed in forms, of, the question is, if I handed and make sure I get this right, if I handed in forms three years ago to Crowsdale, can I see them or what did I hand in? Is that what your question was? Yeah. Yeah. So um, your navigators have access to what's in our electronic medical system. You can sit down with your navigator and they can go through our electronic system and say, this is what we have. And I do recommend that you do that. I have pulled up documents that are from 1998. And I'm like, is this the most current document? You know, so 
Um, your navigators have access to the, um, to the electronic medical record. They can tell you what we have and then you can go from there. Well, I suppose that having changed the name of my power of attorney, they just initially. Rum, rum. <laughs> <laughs> so the question is, or what she says is that she was told that she could change the name of her power of attorney and just initial it. Um, and I would say, no, that is not, um, I would go ahead and fill out an entirely new document and get it signed and notarized if um, I, I, we've seen a couple of forms like that and it's, it's not legal to just scratch through something and write another name. You need to do an entirely new document. Now, this person was listed as the second person. Is that not? What was the first person still alive? The, the, the question was that the second person on the document told them that they could just cross out the first person and put their name and it would be all set. Was the first person on the, your documents still alive and able to, to take that position? I I am going to urge you to just do a clean document so there's no con confusion. You really don't want any confusion with those documents. So if you do have changes, I say go ahead, no, no crossing out names. If somebody is deceased, I mean, you, you list, you know, people in succession, and if somebody is deceased, it goes to the second one. That's that's fine, but um, I would do a whole new document. Yes. You mentioned just now about uh, digitally uh, keeping documents. Is there anything under foot about keeping up with our research and travel and uh, also with our brains and so forth? Hmm. So the question is, is keeping those documents maybe digitally. So you have your power of attorney, your healthcare power of attorney, your living will, these things. Um, those documents you could put on a flash drive and you could take them, uh, you know, with you on a flash drive. I will warn you that the DNR and the pink copy most form, those need to be paper copies. You can't put any of that on a, on a flash drive. But your powers of attorney, your living will, that kind of stuff, you could put on a flash drive and take with you in that form. Uh, it's a little bit on the power of attorney. When I, uh, pardon me, I hope you're power of attorney. When I had mine run up, it actually contained things like, no, I did not want to have any food or water, or yes, I did. Questions like that. Is that basically what you were talking about as the uh, living will? So that one document that the lawyer did for me contains both of those things. And then you just said something about we can't use digital copies of which documents? Um, let me first answer your first question, which has to do with your question was when I went to the attorney, I'm, I'm repeating it. When I went to the attorney, um, you had a document that looked like a living will and a healthcare power of attorney all in one. Yes. Very common to see that. So that's not unusual. Um, with regards to the previous question about the electronic copies, I think he's he was asking, is there a way to take them and not have to carry paper? Your durable power of attorney, your healthcare power of attorney, your living will could be electronically saved on a flash drive. You may be able to, if you're in another state, um, get somebody at a different hospital to um, to take that flash drive or or a family member 
you know, take it to another family member's house and they could plug that in and then they could pull those documents down. My lawyer, again, besides sending me paper on the documents, did send me the files electronically. Mm -hmm. So I've got them and, and basically can put them on my phone or anything I want. I assume they can use those. You can. Yes, you can use the electronic documents. Um, it's probably going to be, um, uh, you know, when you get to a medical establishment, I'm not sure that they're going to take your phone and, and want to read your document on your phone. They're probably going to want a copy somehow for their records. Um, but but for, for traveling purposes, for getting them from one place to another, for storing them, yeah, the, the storing them electronically is, is fine. But the, the hospital may want a printed copy. I don't, uh, are there any questions from the chapel? Yes. Is it yeah. okay if yeah. this is a question from the chapel? Is it okay if documents were made in Orange County rather than Durham County? So the counties actually don't matter that much. North Carolina law um, you know, covers um, well, let me let me rephrase that. Um, you certainly want your documents drawn up in North Carolina. If you have a document that's filed in Orange County, um, I think that's still going to be honored here as long as it's filed. Not exactly sure on that, but what I will tell you is that the last session is a attorney. And we could ask that, that question to that attorney. So we have that very question to our attorney because we moved here from Orange County and our attorney said it's filed in Orange County, that's all we need. Yeah. Yeah, I was I'm thinking that it that's yeah, the the um the question or the it was confirmed that uh, a lawyer had told a participant here that it's if it's filed in Orange County, that should be fine for uh, residing in Durham County. Question was, where do we get one of the eight and a half by 11 sleeves? That can be, um, you can come to my office or one of the navigator's offices. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. My question is. Mm -hmm. It's okay. Go ahead, Mr. Bushman. My question is uh, it said earlier in the beginning of this that it was being recorded. And so, the question I know there's a date that I'm not going to give information. So, how do we get to record? Or get sure. Yeah. So the question is, is that this uh, um, this whole series is being recorded and um, we're going to actually see the quality of the recording um, and then we're, we'll determine, I think, at a later date how we're going to utilize that. It was thought that the um, that we wanted to give people the ability to ask questions. Um, as opposed to just kind of giving it to somebody and having them be like, whoa, I've got so many questions. So we may do this again and use those recordings again. Um, but we, you can talk with us later. And we can also put the, um, on the resource page on the Death by Design website, we'll put up like, for example, a handout you got today of our slides, a PDF of that will be on the Death by Design website. So you can always check the resources page after each session as well. Yes, so, and Caroline was nice to say that um, all the slides from today's session will be on the resource page of the website. So you can pull those slides off from the website. So I have a follow-up. 
uh, based on the questions you just experienced, I think the vast majority of people would do be in much better shape if they could just screen the presentation online off the website. So my strong recommendation is come up to the July 22 and make it work that way. That is possible. We could upload this on online and then post the link to this video. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So the the request from from the audience is to to have the videos uh, online, um, and we can put we can post it on our website that we've done. So, all right. For give my chart, how many POAs can we name? We have we have children who are two hours plus away. Mm -hmm. We would like to have alternatives if one cannot make it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, and to clarify, the question was for Duke my chart, and you're you're asking about powers of attorney, but I think what Duke my chart and powers of attorney are two different things. So, if you want to draw up a power of attorney, you can name one, two, or three different people as your powers of attorney, those one, two, or three different people can serve at the same time. In other words, if one of them is available and the other not, that one person can make those decisions. Or you can list it as, I want them in successive order. In other words, my son, he's going to be first in line, but if my son is not able to do it, then my daughter comes next. So it can be concurrent that they serve all at the same time, or it can be in succession. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I have two comments. One is no, you're good. Are you okay? Yeah. Putting this on the web, the, the, uh, website would be good because I was giving notes for someone who's in recap at uh, the pavilion. And the only one is the time. That's number one. Number two is I assume that a uh, conversation project, you go online, do it, and can get forms and whatever. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So two questions. One was um, to make sure that things were put online. Uh, because there are people that can't come. Uh, there are people in different situations that I know could not make it here today. So we will have the notes online. And number two, with regards to the website, the conversation project, they have many different forms and different things to help you through that conversation. And you just um, print them right off the internet. They're very useful tools. Would it be possible for you to bring the copies of the four wishes and the larger um, postings for the bridge to our next session? Yes, the question is, can we bring uh, the five wishes and the um, uh, the big eight and a half by 11 file of life to the next session? And what I think we may do, we are going to hold an expo the third Wednesday. I'm really looking forward to that. Um, and we're going to have different vendors here, uh, but we're also going to have a table as well. The, the navigation department will have a table. So I think we're going to definitely bring uh, the, the material that we routinely look at and, and hand out in uh, through the navigation department. So I think we're going to have a lot of resources at that table. Yes. Any questions from the chapel? Wow, okay. Well, we are at 325. No, yeah, 325. That's pretty good. Wait, we got one more. Okay, get us to 330. <laughs> I confuse you to me because I get a little different guidance from a lawyer versus the medical people. 
And so to fill out a DNR immediately is not necessarily appropriate because I probably want to fill it out after there's a reason to fill it out. Granted, I may create a problem for myself, but that just kind of seems the best way to, to deal with it. So I guess my question would be, will this be addressed by the lawyers and medical people uh, in the future sessions? So the question has to do with uh, do not resuscitate order and maybe is this the right time to fill it out? And there's, I think you've had some different guidance from attorneys versus, you know, doing it now. I will definitely say that for most of you, many of you in this room, you know, you're still going strong. Um, it, it, it very well may not be an appropriate time to do a DNR. And the doctor needs to sign that and the doctor needs to sign it for a reason. And that's because they're going to have a conversation with you. And if they've got a 30 year old who comes into the office and says, I don't want to be resuscitated, they're going to talk that 30 year old out of it because you've got plenty of life ahead of you. And, and so that's the conversation that you're having with the doctor is, is this appropriate you know, if, if you've got a bad ticker or if, you know, things aren't working right, then it gets, you know, it's a different conversation. And the doctor is going to be the one to help you through that, that decision. And, and he, that doctor's got to sign that form, uh, knowing that you understand the ramifications of that and that, you know, it all makes sense to, to, to you. Good question, though. Okay, so I got a DNR sign recently. I thought that just meant if I was essentially dead, they would have tried to bring me back. But you're saying that I have a heart attack and I'm not going to sit down and just have to lie down? Yeah. So, so the question is, um, I just, they just got a DNR signed recently, and um, she was under the impression that if this, if she were dead, that nobody would uh, intervene at that point. But if she was having a heart attack, um, the, that she would still get intervention. If you have that DNR, that DNR says, even if you're in an arrhythmia where your heart is beating erratically, that they're not going to, uh, they're not going to, you know, engage with a treatment. Um, because you basically said, I don't want to be shocked and I don't want to be um, any CPR done. So you may want to, you may want to have that conversation with your doctor. I can't hear you, but. <laughs> well, Dr. Wright told me that if your heart can stop even when you're not breathing, that if you're having a heart attack, you will get treatment. If you are Okay, and we can certainly, Dr. White will be here next week, so she can clarify that. Maybe um, I'm wrong, and here's the other thing is that for every DNR that is recognized, it's the person that recognizes that as to what their understanding is of that DNR. So, um, I don't know if this helps, but I can't do this with my friend. And he signed in yellow, or the doctor signed in yellow DNR, brought it up to him when he went in palliative care. Okay, prior to that, there wasn't anything. So, it's usually going to usually it will be brought up. The yellow thing that you have on your refrigerator um, when you know, you're at the point where you, you do not want to be resuscitated because you, you know, are a guy. Right, right, yes. So participant just clarified that uh, she had her husband um, be uh, just given a DNR order um, while he's now just being admitted to palliative care. So it is something that you see more towards the end of life. Yes, when you're getting medical complications and things like that, that's when a DNR comes into play. Mm -hmm. 
There's a medical term I use when I talk to a physician about my DNR wishes, and that is flawed. I don't want any flogging. <laughs> and most people understand that. I'm not sure how to rephrase that. <laughs> so medical term called flogging? And she does not want it. <laughs> That's what she tells her doctor. She doesn't want any flogging. Any, any other questions? We're now at, uh, at 3.30. I appreciate it. Thank you all for coming. We look forward to the next uh, four weeks, four and a half weeks. Great. What? I think it's in medical. Let's uh, Google it. <laughs> <laughs> To be severe. Right. It is. And you know, yes. Yeah. When you're getting compressions, they're they're people. I was told by a friend and uncle who's like died. The sole reason why we have that yellow piece of paper. Yeah, but see here, security comes first. And if they see that, then they probably should not call the paramedics. They will. Well, typically, they will. They will. Well, no, they will call the paramedics unless hospice is involved. If hospice is involved, they call hospice. But if the hospice isn't involved, they will call the paramedics. But they'll have Even that. Had a yeah, they'll have that phone there. Now, nine times out of ten, the DNR is going to go with hospice. I mean, all hospice patients are going to have a DNR. But those folks, yeah. So, so you could have, you know, anybody with a DNR could fall and break their arm. I mean, just because you have a DNR doesn't mean that you're not going to get attention. But it's it's a matter of well, it depends on which one. It does. If it's a heart pain, they can tell that. Right. Security right. can tell if you just hurt your arm. But security's not going to know whether you just knock yourself unconscious or whether it's a heart or something like that. So they will call security. They'll call nine one one. Yeah, yeah. 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 We reported it. Uh huh. Oh yeah. So we got a form. Oh, yeah. so we talked about that. Um, and I think the jury is still out on uh, how we're going to do that. We have a website, and uh, you can go if you go to Vibrant and click on that by design, you can get to our website, and that's going to have resources. Definitely, you will get the yeah, and uh, we, will, we have to get our team and see how we can do that. We had 30 minutes of questions. And so we're a little hesitant to just say, here, watch this. Because we, want, we kind of want to be there for the question. We don't want somebody to be left out. In, 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 in. So what we did think about, I know. Yeah, we did. We did think about actually just running the video again with the support of one of the navigators there, and just doing it at a you know next. But were the questions at the end? Or the, yeah. the questions were at the end. Yeah, so you could do the video. Well, what I'm saying is, is there were so many questions that if you watch the if you watch our presentation, you would probably have ten questions. 
And I don't want you to be sitting out in your apartment going, well, wait, now I've got all these questions. <laughs> Well, maybe well, in the session today, for those who saw it online, and other questions. Right. And we could do it. Um, yeah. I mean, there's, 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 different, there's different. We're going to see what these evaluations hold, and um, we're going to go from there. I was surprised, a little bit surprised at how many open chairs there were. Although we, you know, we had the yeah, yeah. So like our floor meeting had been planned for three or four months, and I guess it could have been moved back. Yeah, but but it was hard to be here. But this is the kickoff. I don't think that you could just put it on black. Yes, if they have questions, they can make them. Right. And most of them are simple questions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. And email us. And all sorts yeah. of them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> if they're going to miss them all, that's one thing. But if you're just going to miss one. Right. Okay. <laughs> 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 